I was 14 years old and had my first sexual encounter with a man. Afterwards, I prayed that I was bisexual and not a homosexual. That seemed the worst of all sexual identities to me at the time. I started my career as a lawyer and lived together with a woman. A bit later, I fell in love with a man and then I knew. I am gay. I'm still in love with him, by the way. I was an openly gay judge. I was asked to run for parliament. Some people said, don't talk about your sexuality. I always answered, how can I represent the people if I cannot represent myself? The biggest victory during my political career. At the time, I did not even realise its importance. I married my husband eight years ago. It is the symbol of equal rights. Human Rights Watch works in more than 90 countries in the world. We operate in many countries that criminalise homosexuality and the UN is a strong ally. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Human Rights LGBT Advocacy Director, Boris Dietrich. Hello everybody, uh, thank you very much for the invitation to have me here. It's really an honour to be in Prague, the city of my father. Um, the theme tonight is East meets West, but in my case, uh, we add a part of the world to it, and that's the global south, because I'm asked to speak about Africa, and that's what I am going to do now. Yes. Um, as you can see, the world has 193 countries that are member states to the United Nations. 193. Out of those 193, 81 countries still criminalize homosexual conduct. 81. And out of those 81, 37 um, are in Africa, in sub Saharan Africa. Now, these are numbers, and when you talk about numbers, you don't really get a feeling with it. So, therefore, I would like to introduce you to. Uh, Roger Nobel. Um, I worked for Human Rights Watch in 2010. I went to Cameroon. Uh, Cameroon is one of those uh, 38 countries in uh, Sub Saharan Africa that criminalizes homosexuality. And um, Human Rights Watch wrote a report and I presented it to the government to the Prime Minister, Minister of Justice, we went to the Parliament, and of course we also talked with activists. One of those activists was Roger Mabede, a philosophy student. In 2010, Roger fell in love with a man, and he sent a text message to this man saying, I'm very much in love with you. He had a date with the man, so he went to his house, and there he was arrested by the police. And he was taken to court, and the judge uh, said, um, are you homosexual, are you a criminal? And he said, yes, I'm gay, but I don't think I'm a criminal, because I love somebody of the same gender. Well, the judge didn't feel for that, and he was sentenced to three years imprisonment. Three years for sending a text message, I'm very much in love with you. In prison, he was raped, he was beaten up, and his health deteriorated. His lawyer, who is a friend of mine, uh, asked Human Rights Watch to send letters to the court to um, put pressure on the judge to release him because of his health situation. And finally, after two and a half years, he was able to go home. He didn't have a place to go, so he thought, let's go back to the village in Cameroon where I came from, and he went back to his parents. But in prison, and this picture is taken in prison, he really became an activist. So he gave interviews about homosexuality and why the law is so unjust. So that was on television um, in Cameroon. And so when he came to his parents, they were so shocked, and they said, the devil has come inside of you. Roger was very weak because of his health situation. His parents blocked him up in a room, didn't give him any water, didn't give him any food, and unfortunately, he died. He starved. They starved him, their own son, 
because he was gay. The story doesn't end there because my friend, his lawyer, received death threats simply because he uh, was a lawyer for LGBT people and he received pictures of his wife and children. So the lawyer had to take his wife and children to the United States where he received asylum simply because he, as a straight man, as a lawyer, was defending LGBT people. That is the face of homophobia in several African countries. And I'm telling you this story because he is one of the people behind the number of 37, 38 countries in Africa. Now, let's go to South Africa. Um, everybody always says South Africa, wonderful country on the African continent because the uh, constitution is wonderful. There is a clause in the constitution that says non-discrimination on the ground of sexual orientation. So it's, it was the first constitution in the world. Same-sex marriages uh, take place, but on the other hand, uh, there is a lot of violence, especially lesbian and gender non-conforming women are the victim of violence in South Africa. Um, and uh, it's actually not only in South Africa, but also in other African countries. And usually it's quite difficult to highlight the situation of lesbian or gender non-conforming women. In this case, I would love to show you um, a short piece of a documentary about my work in Africa, which was shown on the Dutch TV, and I'm inviting you to have a look. It's about six and a half minutes, I guess, and I will give a sign when you have to stop it. The neighbors don't know about your relationship. They don't know. Most of them think we are twin sisters. Oh, OK. Yeah. How, how hard is it for you? I don't have friends. Yeah. She is my best friend. Those two are my best friends. Yeah. So you, you are the first person who has entered my house. Om in haar onderhoud te voorzien, verkoopt Mary tegenwoordig handwerk in een speciaal winkeltje dat gerund wordt door de homogemeenschap. In Kenia heb je ook fantastische natuur. So. Christopher, you want to sit in front? You come and sit with us here in the back. So. Wij gaan samen met Mary, Christopher en Caroline op safari. Op een van de mooiste plekjes van het park vertelt Mary haar dramatische levensverhaal. Tien jaar geleden werd Mary aangesproken door acht mannen. Die wisten dat ze lesbisch was. En dat wilde corrigeren. De nachtmerrie begon. Mary zei dat ze het een rape noemden. Ja. Vertel me eens hoe ze dat bedoelen. They wanted me to feel how, uh, to know how it feels to be with the man. Yeah. Well, they beat me up, uh, they raped me countless times, and they left me for dead at the side of the road. And when I was left there, there was nobody to call what they robbed me, my clothes are torn, there's nothing I can do. I was like, It was so painful. Na dit drama sluit Mary zich wekenlang thuis op. Na een tijdje voelt ze zich zo beroerd dat ze naar het ziekenhuis gaat. En daar krijgt ze opnieuw de schrik van haar leven. Ik was HIV positief. En toen was ik de the doctor, want ik was heel uitspoken. Ik was like, de doctor, hey, every morning I'm feeling my tummy is in a lot of pain, throwing up. And kind of like dizziness and she was telling me the sign you have it seems like you are pregnant uh, I thought it was like I couldn't believe it because I was like okay first I was left now I'm HIV positive again I'm pregnant what am I supposed to do Mary besluit haar baby af te staan voor adoptie 
Maar dat verandert allemaal als Christopher wordt geboren. When I gave birth to that kid and then I looked at the, the smile in that baby's face, that boy face, he gave me this joyful smile. He gave me this true meaning of my life. Uh, to continue living and to be a mother, to be a strong-minded person and to be there for him is my sunshine. I'm not giving out my son to anybody. And he has been my best friend since then. Kort geleden gebeurt er opnieuw iets verschrikkelijks. Als Mary een homo-bijeenkomst verlaat, wordt ze, waar haar zoon bij is, aangevallen door een groep mannen. They ripped us with me and my friend of four from around 8, 8 p.m. Yeah, until 1 a.m. in the morning. And how Then, many men were this? If I tell you how many there were, you cry because there were so many even now. I can't even, whenever I talk about them, that was the horrific experience of my life. I usually say I have the baddest experience, but that one was the baddest, it was the worst. So we meet you now. Uh, I see the joy you get from uh, Christopher and the love you have from Caroline. Yeah. How important are those two now in your life? They're the best thing that ever happened in my life. Can you say they saved you? Yeah, they saved me. Those two, they saved me. Ik heb nog nooit zo'n verhaal gehoord. Mary is zo'n sterke vrouw en dat komt ook door de steun van haar zoon Christopher. Can you climb up here? Uh. So, Christopher, tell me something about your mother. Mm, I'm proud of her because she's always proud of me. She supports me in everything I do. Um, I, I see everything around us because when someone is treating you so badly, it's like I'm gonna die tomorrow and you are going to live forever. If you have faith, you're going to live. But my mom is always having faith. Even if she's at home, she's having AIDS. I'm not, I don't care. I have, I believe in her. And forever, when she needs me, I'll always be there. I'll take care of her. Because she took me, she took care of me. I get it. Great boy. This is uh, another personalized story, and you can see that homophobia doesn't only affect uh, the victim itself, but also the um, people around uh, somebody who's affected by it. I would like to go to Uganda. You might have read about uh, Uganda because the country has been in the news for quite some time. Um, the British colonizers already introduced uh, a criminalization of homosexual conduct. And um, it was already a life imprisonment. And then a few years ago, the discussions started about an extra law, an anti-homosexuality act, um, inspired by um, American evangelicals. And uh, the law had been passed and um, was uh, adopted. Unfortunately, on the 1st of August, the Constitutional Court in Uganda decided that the law is void and nullified, and so the law doesn't exist anymore. Um, when you read the comments about this court's decision, everybody was jubilant and said, wow, finally a victory. And of course, it is a victory, but the court decided to nullify the law simply because there was not a quorum of members of parliament when the law was adopted. And so the, the court didn't decide on the merits of the law itself. 
And so um, we expect that someday, can be quite soon, it can be a little bit later, but someday the law will be reintroduced in a country like Uganda. And horrible things are going on since the law uh, was passed. A lot of uh, people from the LGBT community had to leave their house. They were fired and um, they couldn't go on living. Um, I would like to tell one story about a friend of mine in Uganda. Um, he was working in a shoe shop. He was a shoe seller. And when the law was adopted, the owner of the shoe shop came to him and he said, well, there are some clients who say that you are gay. And because of the new law, I have to fire you. I have to let you go, although you are the best shoe seller I have. And so he was fired, didn't get a salary anymore, and um, had to leave his house. He was evicted and ended up on the street. So he came to one of the leaders of the Ugandan LGBT movement, and he said, well, this is my case. Can you help me? So they looked up um, um, the company, and the company was part of an international chain. And so they uh, discovered that uh, the headquarters was in Montreal, um, in Canada, and they called up um, the company there, and they um, got hold of some human uh, resources person, and they told the story, and then this guy in Canada said, oh, I didn't know this happened because we have an LGBT-friendly policy in our company. So they said, well, can't you call Kampala? So that's what Canada did. Canada calls Kampala, and the end of the story is that the guy has a similar job back. He's not now working in the shoe shop, but in the administration, but at least he has a job and a salary, and he can afford to live somewhere. I'd like to close by um, saying something about the United Nations. I started with the UN. Um, actually, the United Nations as organization is a very staunch supporter of LGBT rights. Um, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon um, decided to really speak out. I'm really pressing on. Yes. Uh, gives a lot of speeches and always the sentence, you are not alone, comes back into those speeches. Um, even when he goes to Africa and he speaks with African leaders, he calls on them to withdraw this terrible anti-gay legislation. Um, and last year they started, the UN started the free and equal campaign. Now, the purpose is that every United Nations office in every country in the world has to roll out that campaign which asks for support for LGBT people. And as we speak in June, since, June, uh, since uh, uh, the last week of June, the United Nations recognizes same-sex marriage for personnel working for the UN. Also, if the personnel is from countries like the Czech Republic, where you cannot get married, if you work for the UN and you get married in the Netherlands, for instance, then the UN will recognize your marriage. And so that's also a big step for the UN as organization. So I wanted to end on that positive note. Thank you very much for your attention.